Hello everyone. Welcome to Risk Roundup. Everything has risk and risks are inevitable. It is the ability to take risk that gives each nation, its government, industries, organizations, academia and individuals, in short referred to as NGIOAI, the possibility of progress and advancement. Progress and advancement is all about risk taking. But when risk transcends initiatives, industries, borders, cultures, nations, societies, and human existence, taking timely risk initiatives is a necessary forward-looking move. As today's risk a tomorrow's crisis, there is a need to make transition from a reactive approach to proactive for identifying, evaluating, and managing risk. Having said that, all the tools, technology, processes, guidelines, and framework in the world won't help. If risk cannot be accurately identified, objectively evaluated, and effectively managed, because what risks are managed depends on what risks have been identified. The cyberspace has brought complex, chaotic, and challenging time for each nation, its government, industries, organizations, and academia, in short, referred to as NGIOA, in cyberspace, geospace, and space, in short, referred to as CGS. As cyberspace is deeply embedded, Across each component of a nation, its government, industries, organizations, and academia, its crowded interconnections has caught nations off guard. These interconnections and interdependencies raise an important question on whether our current risk management framework, tools, technologies, and processes are effective in managing the security risk of the cyberspace. For example, the ongoing battle between the government and technology companies for the backdoor access. To discuss this further, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Daniel Shoemaker. Professor Shoemaker is the Director of the Masters of Science Information Assurance Program for Cybersecurity and a Principal Investigator for the Center of Academic Excellence Program with the NSA. As the Co-Chair of the National Workforce Training and Education Initi Initiative, he is also one of the authors of the DHS Software Assurance Common Body of Knowledge. He has also helped author the DHS Information Assurance Essential Body of Knowledge and serves as a subject matter expert for the NIST NICE Workforce Framework. He has written many, many books, Cybersecurity, the Essential Body of Knowledge, Information Assurance for the Enterprise, the CSSLP Certification All-in-One Exam Guide, Engineering a More Secure Software Organization, and has just finished working on two new books, the Complete Guide to Cybersecurity Risk and Controls and Cybersecurity, and finally, a guide to the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education Framework. Welcome, Professor Dan. We are honored to have you on Risk Roundup. It's my pleasure. Great, wonderful, Professor Dan. So, I feel that for the benefit of our global viewers and listeners, let's begin by having the fundamental understanding and definition of the what exactly is cybersecurity risk in the context of cyberspace? Because I see a lot of people have very, you know, misleading, you know, understanding about what exactly is cybersecurity risk. Well, I mean, risk is is threat based, and so any threat out there uh, to anything you consider to be a value uh, represents a risk. Um, since this threat environment is whatever you define it as, it might be local, it could be global, it could, might in, involve aliens from Mars. Um, the risk is sort of a slippery term. Um, one of the things that's been kind of interesting is there's sort of an additional definition of the, because risk basically is a bad thing, we think. Um, there's been, you know, risk is also sort of a part of kind of moving ahead. And so there's kind of a positive spin on, on the term lately uh, that's both, you know, kind of the concept of, of, of kind of protect, protecting yourself from any kind of harm, but at the same time, sort of considering the options if you decide to step off into uncertainty. And a lot of risk is basically uncertainty. And so, you know, that's the other factor, which is just simply the un uncertainty principle. You know, if you don't know for sure, uh, then whatever step you take is, represents some form of risk. And so basically there's a scale involved from, you know, I think I'll die if I do this to, well, that's pretty easy, you know, pretty likely going to gonna, gonna be the result. And, and, you know, so that sort of pulls in the concept of analysis 
and you know everything that has to do with measurement and assessment that sort of stuff. That that's a long answer to a simple question. Risk basically is whatever you perceive as risk. Yes, I, I agree with you on the fundamental definition of risk. But when you come when from the context of cyberspace, what is a cybersecurity risk? Because I see a lot of you know people thinking the cybersecurity risk is equal to information security risk. And it, what would you tell them? Well, I mean, I I've been in this from. This is like my 15th year, um, and which might sound, you know, I mean, for somebody who's been in as long as I have, it's, that, that doesn't seem like a very long time. But that pretty much, at least in the U.S., kind of covers from the beginning to right now. Um, and I mean, back in the beginning, it was strictly when you're talking about cyber security, or at the time we called it information security, um, and what you're talking about is pretty much everything the government was doing to protect its personal, you know, it's, it's uh, not top secret, but basically, you know, kind of national security data. That's the reason why NSA is in charge of things. Um, the, uh, you know, kind of as it's progressed, particularly with the internet, and again, I, you know, most of you probably are too young to remember 1995, but, you know, I mean, back then that wasn't, the internet really kind of wasn't there at least as the World Wide Web wasn't there, the internet was around. But I mean, the idea basically that what we consider to be just normal life right now, like me talking to you wherever you're at, uh, that wasn't a possibility. Um, and that's only 20 years. You know, you think about the invention of movable type and what took two, 300 years before that kind of got in the Reformation and all the little outcomes of that sort of thing. Um, this is maybe even a, the World Wide Web and everything that has to do with cyber might even be more uh, kind of profound in terms of change and advance, but that's all happened in 20 years. And so getting our minds wrapped around it, you know, we're all in different places basically in terms of understanding what that represents uh, in, in, in terms of how we ought to feel about it and what we ought to do about it. And I could go off forever on, uh, you know, the people that put together the laws of this nation really didn't kind of consider cybersecurity when they did it. And so, you know, all the things that have to do with anything that has to do with control and all of this sort of stuff is based on physical space. Now we got virtual space and almost anything can happen there. And so, I mean, I, you know, I, what I can, what I find myself doing is going down a rabbit, rabbit hole talking to you. So I will just shut up now. <laughs> no, I mean, I hear you on that, but uh, as you said, you know, because of the security aspect that NSA is involved in this and he, they are in charge of the cyber security, but I, I feel that, you know, the definition of security that we have been using all these years is no longer effective because for much of human history, the concept of security largely revolved around use of force and territorial integrity. That, that definition is no longer accurate in cyberspace and digital global age because to a large extent, nations no longer face, as they have so often in the past, a conventional threat of attack of, on their geographical territory. We are talking about cyber territories now, and there are no defined cyber territories. Uh, but we are vulnerable to many other kinds of attacks in cyberspace and these rapidly emerging digital global age. Uh, where nations are moving towards one of the most open societies in a world that is more connected than ever before without the necessary security framework and infrastructure. So my question to you is that how should we define security? Because everything has changed. It is no longer about geographical territory. It is much more complex. The computer code and connected computers have fundamentally changed everything. So how should we define security now? Well, I mean... <laughs> security is security is when you feel secure and you're not secure if you're not secure I mean that's not I they, they pay me a lot of, I mean they pay a lot of tuition money to hear that but bottom line basically is that if you have something of value which is essentially virtual then uh, if you lose it you're harmed um, and that's any definition you want to use a lot of the, the things that drive me nuts is that people tend to view cybersecurity as, as strictly electronic virtual kind of thing. And most of the actual harms based on the definition I just gave you come from physical space, insiders, um, you know, just simple losses, thefts, that sort of stuff. That represents about 70% of the harm or loss or whatever you want to call it out there. 30% is actually 
what you think of when you think of cybersecurity, which is like electronic and hacking. And so if you're going to be secure, you got to be secure. Uh, and that involves basically understanding what you got and what the risks that, uh, you know, that what threatens it, uh, and then putting together kind of a coherent um, plan, strategy, policy and procedure, whatever you want to call it, uh, an operational process to oversee it. But first you got to know what you got. And I think if you ask any CEO out there, tell me what, what you have in terms of assets, virtual assets, uh, you know, your designs, your plans, even the, not just the money in the bank, that sort of stuff. Um, they think you're an idiot. You know, how could I tell you that? I don't know, have the slightest idea. But basically, if you don't know what you got, you don't know what you're going to lose. And you, you can't even start talking about securing it until you know what you're securing. And most people don't know that. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if you say, well, where do I start? You start basically by doing a complete inventory of what, you know, kind of what you don't want to lose. Yes, no, you are absolutely right, what we don't want to lose. But I think uh, the fundamental, you know, concern I have about the how cybersecurity is viewed is that people just think that, you know, whatever is digital, that is at risk and that we need to worry about. But I think that this, we need to add a component of strategic security because the digital global is the ability to digitalize, the ability to have new models, new way of doing things is fundamentally, you know, putting everything that we have developed in the geospace, in the physical world at risk. So, you know, even the government, let's talk about government and government uh, governance model and uh, the government uh, roles and responsibilities. How many things can be done digitally in a different way? Same for businesses, how, how the business processes are, can be fundamentally changed. We have so many examples in front of us, Amazon, Uber, all these, you know, companies have fundamentally changed, you know, the way of doing things. So I feel the risk group that we have defined security as the state of entities across NGIOA, that means nations, is government, industries, organizations, and academia in cyberspace, geospace, or space being free from the danger or threat of cyberspace. So it is not only about what, you know, it's hacking or what we have in the cyberspace, but because of cyberspace, what is a threat? What are the different, you know, models, processes, governance frameworks, and products and services that are at risk because of the cyberspace? That is, you know, I see lacking, you know, all across nations. People are not paying attention to strategic risk, and which is exactly what, you know, we will discuss even in the risk management frameworks that we have currently, that everyone pays attention to uh, operational risk, legal risk, financial risk, Compliance is now they most of the organizations corporations they don't pay attention to strategic risk which makes up almost about 75 percent of the risk portfolio and has the biggest impact but that is not paid attention to only the 25 percent that is especially the compliance and legal risk which they are forced to do that's where the heavy focus is that's where the resources are and that's the biggest you know risk that i see you know we are facing because there is no proper understanding and because of that the, even the risk management frameworks that we have they are not very effective because they are focusing only on compliance every corporation you see they are just talking about compliance risk and you know operational risk legal risk and financial risk nobody is talking about strategy so you do all these risk management focusing on only this uh, you know smaller focused area and you are not paying attention to how the digital global age or how the capability of digitalization and you know is going to fundamentally change your what you are doing or you could you know completely eradicate that in the coming months or years nobody people are normally not paying attention to that and that is a critical risk i feel that you know every nation its uh, government industries organizations academia are facing right now so the traditional notion is that security and another factor that i see is that people think that security is a government effort like everybody people in the united states probably feel that you know security is government affair or nsa should you know worry about that why do we need to worry about that but i think that traditional notion that security is a government affair the digital global edge is, has made security an NGIOA affair it has made security everybody's affair so each corporation each business each industry 
each academia or even individuals and governments everybody needs to play a role in security because each individual or an entity within any component of a nation has a role to play in ensuring security irrespective of terrorism or any other critical challenge facing a nation the security risk of interdependencies and the cyberspace uh, has connected everything cyberspace has connected to us to you know geospace as well as the space so everything is connected and everything is interdependency so how can we you know have a model or a framework where only one component of a nation is you know responsible for the security of the uh, country whereas you know especially you will see right now the ongoing battle between the government uh, government and the technology companies and international internet service providers about the backdoor access government wants a backdoor access for security which is understandable the technology companies don't want to give that because that fundamentally undermines their effort of you know telling their you know users consumers that you know they will provide ensure their privacy but at the same time we do need to manage our security risk so how do we do that with the framework that we have currently how we define security how we have structured everything we cannot do that so that's what uh, what are your thoughts on that how do we manage this kind of risk using the uh, the current model of security and the governance framework well i mean first of all and most important of all the government is not a solution never has been never will be i work on that side all the time and it's funny they're afraid of looking like they're trying to regulate and so you know they spend a lot of time saying well we're going to suggest but it's up to you you know and i mean most of the stuff the government develops is is just simply not possible in a, in a uh, for-profit business. Uh, the government has got uh, all the money in the world. I mean, that's what they make taxpayers for. But, um, you know, when you talk about moving that over, say, Ford, which is it, it, where I live, that's overhead. And so a lot of the problem is that um, people just don't want to pay for it. Um, it's like car insurance. You know, I've never been in an accident all these years, but I've paid a lot of money in car insurance, uh, and I don't want to stop doing that. Uh, but you walk up to a CEO whose profit margin is about that thick and say, why don't you take some of that down because, it, you know, you want to be able to protect yourself in the digital universe, which he completely doesn't understand because he's an MBA. And so, you know, a lot of the problem is they view this as a technical issue, not strategic or governance or you know basically the responsibility is at the very top and with the board always has been always will be because they're the only ones who are going to get everybody to do it anything now from a governmental standpoint that's the last thing we ought to be turning to is the people that i mean NIST gives you standards standards are useful because they're a frame of reference that's assuming anybody is willing to adopt it um the thing that led me into this by the way was uh, it was at the time it was called BS 7799. That's the great grandfather of the ISO 27000 standard. Um, and, you know, of course, there was a couple of problems with that. First of all, it was British, so we don't do that in the US. And, you know, even with 27000 now, we don't do that. But let me give you another thing to think about in terms of what you mentioned, but it's it's been my main area of study is supply chains. Um, <clears throat> that's a business prospect, you know. I'm going to outsource it somewhere, and they're going to outsource it somewhere, and then they're going to outsource it somewhere. Uh, that's a major national issue right now because we're starting to get malware uh, at the bottom of the supply, injected at the bottom of the supply chain that's showing up at the top because we don't make software in the U.S. anymore. We integrate it. And so we buy it from the Indians who buy it from the Vietnamese who buy it from the Red Chinese. And pretty soon our weapon systems have got Chinese malware in all of them because we lost track of, you know, and that's got the government freaked. Uh, it should have every CEO and every corporation freaked because you don't know what you're buying when you buy uh, a product that's been written somewhere by somebody. We don't know who, you know, it's just, so at any rate, I mean, what you basically are raising is it's, it, first of all, it's a, it's a strategic issue. It's going to involve uniform participation. People may not like it because it's going to cost them you know, all that sort of stuff. And so it works against human nature. And, you know, um, a lot of what you got going here is something where you're going to take, it's going to take some kind of mass recognition of the issue. And, you know, I mean, they talk about digital pro harbors. 
Uh, I know people get in trouble for by even raising those sorts of things. But, you know, there's a part that sort of says the average American out there really doesn't care about that stuff uh, until they get hit. Uh, when they do care about it, you know, it's after the fact. Um, and, you know, if the country as a whole basically said, we got to be secure, you know, you're buying all these airplanes and you're protecting us, you know. But what, you know, what are you doing about uh, the, the fact that, you know, kind of our entire infrastructure is totally unprotected uh, from cyber tag? Uh, you know, and when all the lights go out someday, uh, because somebody somewhere decided to take down our uh, electric power system, which is SCADA based, and I don't know whether that's anything that's ever been raised. Uh, with you, but SCADA along with supply chains is probably our number one problem, you know, little, uh, not very, I mean, have, have no security built into them, PL program logic controllers uh, that kind of run our life. Um, and somebody somewhere, I mean, with no protection whatsoever, and then you hook those things to the internet, and it's like inviting somebody who's, you know, a bad guy somewhere to kind of, to kind of come in and turn off all our lights. If they do that, it'll be six months before we get it back. Um, by that point, we'll probably have all turned to cannibalism. So, you know, you've got those kind of issues out there. And the very large scale, people just can't wrap their mind around. But they're just a fact. And so you say, you know, you got, I mean, I was at a lecture uh, day four yesterday in Detroit. And they're telling, extolling the wonders of the driverless car. You know, I live about 10 minutes from where Google is located in Ann Arbor. And what a wonderful thing it was and how many things it's going to save and gas and all that sort of stuff. And for somebody like me who's a security guy, that's like a nightmare. You know, if I want to bump off my boss or, you know, anybody else, all I got to do is hack into their driverless car and drive them off a cliff. And, you know, and I was going to raise that and I thought, no, they're so full of joy here. I don't really want to upset them. But, I mean, the other problem with being a security person is you bring up big picture issues like that. And what you get is an awful lot of pushback under the heading. Wow, why are you so gloomy? So, yeah, I mean, you know, the bottom line, basically, the, the, my, the analogy I use, two analogies, and I don't know whether it'll be useful to you. One of them is the elephant analogy. It's an old, uh, I don't know, myth about uh, six blind men and an elephant. And for them, you know, whatever they're touching is the elephant. And it, the, I think the line is in the end, they were all entirely right and all entirely wrong. That describes the current industry. <clears throat> and so everybody out there is selling something. Everybody out there, I mean, on the bureaucratic side, everybody out there has got turf. And so DHS, NSA, you know, all those sorts of folks aren't working with each other. They're working basically to push themselves forward. And, you know, and so right now I got a turf war going on between NIST and, and NSA uh, about their frameworks. That sort of thing is perfect human nature understandable, completely understandable, and I would do exactly the same thing in that sort of situation. Is that helping at a large scale? No, but we don't have a leadership who's capable of being able to say, okay, now stop all that and let's get this coordinated. Uh, Obama's trying it, but it's turned, it's the same sort of thing that, that you know, is going on in Washington, basically everybody, you know, if I say up, you say down, that sort of stuff. And so there's no coordination going on. Since it's worldwide, it's really going to happen at the highest levels possible, and that gets you in all that idealistic United Nations never going to happen kind of stuff. And that's one sort of thing. The other thing is the grizzly bear analogy, which you want to understand cyberspace right now and how to protect yourself. You're walking through the woods, you're running into a grizzly bear. Grizzly bear is a lot faster than you are, uh, you know, and you're doomed. How are you ever going to be able to save yourself? Well, you can save yourself as long as you can outrun one other person. You don't have to run, outrun the bear. And a lot of the security thing is just, um, what do you call it? I think it's the Seltzer and Schroeder thing about um, uh, work factor. If I can make it a little bit harder, then they'll go after somebody else. The only problem is sooner or later they're going to run out of sheep. You know, they'll get around to you. And so, you know, the, the fact that you're safe only means that you're not yet been a target. Um, and everybody I know out there on the bad side uh, is a lot smarter than everybody I know up there who's on the good side. And, you know, they basically consider uh, pretty much the cyberspace to be their personal hunting ground. Um, that's, that's the way it is. I don't see any... Uh, now, frameworks, we've got some models. The models actually probably are going to... They all do pretty much the same thing. And so when you start talking about principles at the model level, 
what you're talking about basically is, first of all, the process base. They have nothing to do with the electronics. You know? They haven't involved installing systematic top-level processes that you follow. 27,000, the RMF, all that sort of stuff, even stuff, stuff like idle, are uh, you know kind of stretch strategic deployment on a systematic process that you follow. Uh, and that's not hard to get your mind around, you know, and if you're a CEO, you ought to be able to do that. You can get herds of nerds out there that you can get put down to the, you know, busy work. But the idea basically is direction. We have no leadership, none, not in the private sector, not in the public sector, you know, and everybody basically in the U S has got this thing about how the Europeans don't know what they're doing. And the Europeans get the thing about how the Americans don't know what they're doing. And then we've got the folks over in India and we've got the people, you know, and so, I mean, it's a classic, I can't pronounce this Tower of Babel, Babel, whatever it is, you know, that biblical thing situation right now in security. And until, you know, some white knight comes along and says, basically, this is the way it's going to be and provides the leadership and direction necessary to, to kind of at least start the process, we're never going to be secure. So basically, I'm buying a lot of canned goods and making friends with the Amish. So I can, you know, when, when, when an apocalypse happens, I'll still be able to eat. Yes, no, you are right. I mean, there are complex challenges and uh, uh, it's uh, very difficult for, and there are only finite resources. So uh, it's understandable that uh, every corporation, every government, uh, they are trying to do things uh, as they have been always trying to do. And But this is, I think cyberspace is going to bring very much bigger complex challenges because of the artificial intelligence. Because when, arti when you see the kind of hacking happening, it's uh, it comes at such a rapid speed that you know it's beyond human uh, capability to be able to manage it effectively that's where we need to probably focus on how we need to develop frameworks and processes and tools technologies that we can effectively use to manage this kind of uh, complex uh, uh, security challenges but uh, if we talk about for a moment the ongoing battle between the apple and fbi uh, for the back door uh, I feel that this is a perfect example for the lack of effective risk management framework because for to me is that each nation has at some point in their journey as their private entities to divest or invest with other nations based on their policies and goals. In the current times, as banks and financial institutions are compelled to prevent money laundering by organized crime and terrorist finance networks, should the internet service providers and technology and social businesses be compelled to crack down on the communication of terrorism or communication of uh, terrorists. It seems that there is a call, as we talked about the backdoor, that would allow government agencies to allow encrypted data that would help them in their investigation. And there is resistance to this demand, which is understandable. I feel that the governments that we cannot allow governments to have a backdoor because that opens up a huge you know security challenges but at the same time i feel that each and every uh, technology company social you know uh, organization the social networking organization like facebook and all twitter facebook and the internet service, service providers they have accountability towards security if banks and financial institutions are a you know forced to you know compelled to tell that you know okay when somebody is trying to do this kind of money laundering you have to you know notify the government i feel that you know the technology companies and all these you know other organizations that are involved in this where they have an ability to see that such kind of you know communication is happening that could damage the assets within the nation or industries then they are they should be telling that to the government if they don't open the back door, at least they should have a way to notify to themselves know first that this kind of you know communication is happening, and then they should notify the right authorities. That is mandate. I think it should be you know happening. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, you're talking about the legal system here in essence. You know, like what's going on between Apple and the government right now. Uh, in particular, and you know, that's a classic. If it were something where it was like in physical space, that'd be something you'd issue a warrant for. You would go through the you know, kind of legal system. What we commonly recognize as being the, the basis that we use to decide about people's rights. And in that case, probably that thing would that they get some kind of a, a warrant. Problem is, we don't have that 
particular uh, precedent in the legal system, which was put together in the 1600s. And, you know, a lot of what we're talking about here is sort of new law, uh, new uh, ways of viewing whatever it is we do. You know, I mean, it's, it, it's to the entire criminal justice system and everything that has to do with courts, they're all set up on physical property and physical world, okay? Uh, now you've got stuff where you've got folks that can kind of, kind of commit crimes wherever they want, not just the terrorist folks. I mean, that there ought to be a very simple warrant. I don't see any reason why they haven't been able to do that, but for whatever reason, um, you know, there's no mechanism in the courts to be able to get them to sort of open up that particular person's particular phone. Uh, and that's kind of what warrants are all about. You know, you're going to say, well, I want to come in and search your blog. You got to specify where you're going, what you're looking for. Um, and for whatever reason, they haven't been able to do that. I'm not privy to any of that sort of stuff. Listening to Apple rap itself and the flag is hilarious because, you know, they're protecting our constitutional rights. I mean, the most of the iPhones are built in China. It's not exactly a case of patriotism there, you know, it's, yes, yes. Uh, but you know, it's what they do. And, you know, I don't blame them. Uh, if they can get away with it and nobody laughs at it, it's fine. But I mean, the bottom line basically is you got why they're, Digging in like they are is is a mystery. There must be some marketing reason. The from uh, the standpoint of the courts, the fact they can't get that warrant is really sort of odd. You know, you can if I want to tap your phone or bug you or do an answer sort of stuff as the NSA, I just got to get go through that that court. I can't just lost the name of it, but and get permission to do that. And you know that plugs directly into the criminal or into the court system, justice system. Um, and, you know, but I mean, the bottom line basically is that we, the laws of, that kind of regulate that sort of stuff also aren't, uh, you know, kind of updated, passed about. And so it's like the Wild West that way. I actually teach a course in cyber law. And one of the things that I find really, really interesting about that is that it, there, it's very clear that um, we, that, that the people that, you know, kind of the legal system just can't actually adapt to the fact that of, of virtuality and so you know you, and you get people that commit crimes if i if i walk in the bank say stick them up and you put a bunch of money in the bank and i go out the door and i get caught i'll get 20 years if i hack into the bank steal twice as much money i'll probably get you know a year and a half two years and some sort of because you know it's not a violent crime or something like sort of stuff and I mean, like I said, it's just the, the courts are based on precedent. There is no real precedent for what's going on right now because it's happened too fast and they're just not able to catch up. Uh, and, you know, from an international law standpoint, then you've got jurisdictional issues. If I break into your computer from the Ukraine and steal everything you've got, actually, if I do it from China, I'm likely to get a hero of the, you know, people award for, for uh, bringing down an entire company. Uh, and so, you know, and, and I mean, you got cultural issues, uh, you know, I don't like you, you don't like me. So one of my, one of my people do that, then, you know, I'm going to probably reward them, not punish them. And I mean, like I said, it's, it's just happened too fast for us to get our minds around. The technology has evolved too fast, uh, for us to be able to control it. And, you know, I was in a conference once just because I was feeling kiddish because I knew that they, they were going to, you know, I'm an old Dan, I'm basically a character. You know, and I said, well, if you want to basically get your arms around this, stop developing and selling new technological products for the next 10 years while we catch up. And they all thought, yeah, that guy's quite a joker, isn't he? That's not going to happen. But it's not going to be able to do it because, you know, the technology evolves into kind of to a point where there's no, we have whole new whole businesses out there that didn't exist five years ago. Uh, and, you know, in terms of marketing controls, regulations, you name it, we don't do any of that. Why? Because, you know, it, it's going to take five, six years to catch up. And I might add one last thing. Any textbook you read is, by definition, five years out of date. You get an idea, you sell it to the publisher, you write the thing, they go through the editing process, they put it out there, and it's five years later. Absolutely right. I mean, uh, you wouldn't believe how many requests I get from uh, publishers to write the books about cybersecurity and give it to them, and I decline all of them. I tell them, look, the rapid pace at which developments are happening. I write a book today. I will finish it, you know, within a month or two, and I will give it to you. You will take at least three, four months, you know, for the peer review process, and by the time you publish the book, it will be almost like a year. 
and what good is that book you know because a lot of things would have changed by that time so i i refused to i wrote one book and now i refuse to write those books because it to me it's irrelevant and then the models the book publishers have you know the way they market it and this uh, sell it I, i think it's very outdated because we want if you want a lot of people to read about cyber security and if you want them to have understanding you need a different format and that is the reason why we started risk rounder because it is very current if something is happening today i have a dialogue today it's out there people get the information quickly and they have understanding so i think book publishing is probably outdated for certain you know uh, different segments but coming back to your point about that you know the way technology is developing too fast and we are not able to keep up as far as you know the standards of frameworks and processes and laws goes you are absolutely right about that but i also see another bigger challenge that you know about the software development <laughs> we are in so much hurry about developing software with all different cool you know functionalities everybody is paying attention to the functionalities nobody is paying attention to the security so i think you know sooner or later there is going to be a legal challenge to the software developers because if they are not developing software is keeping security in mind keeping security first architecture in mind as a priority then sooner or later i think uh, legal liabilities they are going to face because that is a uh, they are at the root cause of everything if they don't develop softwares that are vulnerable to security then a lot of these problems that we are facing won't be there so at this point they are not uh, you know facing the heat but i i feel that you know sooner or later that's going to happen when people start you know uh, blaming and who is at the root cause of all these problems so i think that's going to happen but let's talk about uh, this topic that the computer code the connected computers and the ecosystem that makes the cyber space brings complex challenges as we have been talking for last you know 15 20 minutes to everything and everyone from geospace cyberspace to space this tectonic shift of the nature of risk brought on by the cyberspace is creating complex challenges for each and every ngo that means nations is government industries organizations academia and also individuals due to cyberspace the nature of risk has evolved not only in cyberspace but also in geospace and space so what would you tell to our global viewers and listeners as to the complexity of risk that they are facing due to cyberspace i mean not many even entities know what kind of risk they are facing but how would you what would you tell to the global you know viewers and listeners about the nature of risk we are facing now and will be facing in the coming years because of this whole you know new tectonic shift uh, because of the cyberspace first of all i can't answer that because i have no idea what's going to go on two years from now even in terms of the uh, you know kind of what's about i started in this business in 68 i was only two at the time but um and you know so i basically kind of bottom up in the and i mean the stuff that we were doing even back in the 80s and 90s is nothing like the complexity of right now uh in terms of de- development or anything else that has to do with the whole you know um somebody was telling me that the uh app the uh apple the, the iphone has got four times more uh lines of code than in it than uh the apollo uh you know that what basically what what the software that pop, powered the apollo missions we're talking about people landing on the moon with one quarter of the functionality or at least the potential functionality of an iphone yes uh and that's not talking about any of the kind of other you know you talk about big enterprise system for basically it's skynet we have no control over it and in a lot of ways it sort of has control over itself and and so you know the idea of securing anything is that the key to everything as far as i'm concerned is awareness I, you know and i keep it's why i'm in education i think but people basically just have to be aware that there is a threat and kind of the general categories of risk that that they might be facing either personally or kind of nationally um you know personally it, the whole concept of of cyber crime which is by far beyond the drug trade you know it's number one with a bullet yeah you know in terms of kind of profitability if you want to use that word for the for the for the criminal side of things but you know you think we got a big war on drugs have been having one forever i think we've got the dea is you know that's what it does um we don't have a war on cybercrime and yet cybercrime is much worse much more prevalent you know 
Um, and again, it's the same thing. We haven't really caught up with that concept. Um, but I mean, first of all, be aware. You know, don't click on those links. Don't do that sort of stuff. Um, you know, there was a exercise, op sex exercise he did, and I'm not going to say in what, uh, what government agency, but basically sent out an email that said, there's a virus in this email, don't click on the link. 65% of the people opened the email. Yes. 35% clicked on the link. Yes. Yeah, you know, and I mean, they either thought it was a joke or they wanted to see what would happen or whatever, you know. So, I mean, that's an awareness problem. Then think about, uh, you know, all those old people who when they get a letter from their bank saying you're overdrawn and if you don't click on this thing, you're going to be, we're going to say bad things about you. And of course, because the bank back in those days had to trust you click on, you know, and so social engineering schemes and that sort of stuff, which we haven't even really talked about are much more, uh, I don't know what the right word is, you know, they, they, they're, they're more prevalent than electronics uh, exploits. Um, and, you know, that's education, it's awareness. They call it a digital, digi digitally literate population. Uh, and I don't think that that's really, you know, you're talking about maybe five to 10% of the people out there right now who could be considered to be digitally literate. You are, I am, so allegedly, you know, that sort of stuff. But basically what you want to talk about are those sort of folks in the kind of out there in the hills who have got no concept of that and have never been. Um, and so, I, like I said, if, if I had money to spend on one thing, it would be to make everybody out there aware of the issue. Yes. You're doing that here. Uh, unfortunately, it's sort of done under the heading of sound bites, mm -hmm. which don't really kind of carry the message. I don't know whether I got it to you or not, but, you know, from my standpoint, like I said, that's what I would do. And, you know, because the risks are going to keep rolling along and they're going to be whatever they're going to be. But, you know, I mean, if you read the paper and think about it a little bit, you're not going to do the stuff that you do. That's my two cents. Yes, Susan, you're right about that. Now, uh, let's talk about the NIST framework, especially because they have released this uh, framework to manage cybersecurity risk. Uh, be because of the con computer core, connected computers and the Internet, and because the cyberspace now is connected to, is connecting geospace and space, there are so many interdependent risks that are arising because of this, you know, uh, connectivity and integration. Now, how big NIST framework, you know, gives a guidelines, of course, that, you know, public private, they should work together. There should be public private partnership. But my biggest con uh, question is here that just by saying public private, you work together. Is it going to work? It's a good buzzword. <laughs> and, and second, is that even if let's say they want to work, there are entities who want to cooperate, who want to do good for the, you know, uh, their nation, their industries, their society. Is there a structure within the NIST framework to be able to, let's say, you know, somebody, you know, at the bottom found a risk that they feel that that would trans, uh, you know, transfer to their, not only their company, but also to the other businesses within their sector, or the industry or you know their nation then how do they flag that risk is there a structure that integrated framework structure provided which allows them to do that what are your thoughts on that well first of all there's basically three frameworks i want to talk about if you want to talk about NIST that are basically interconnected and basically have kind of or parts of the puzzle the nice framework workforce framework, which is the one that's the most mature and it's the one I did the last book about is, is um, kind of defines the field for the first time. It does it in ways that actually pull everybody into the, I mean, all the years I was in Washington, software security, the whole concept of making software secure and information security were totally different uh, initiatives in two different agencies that didn't talk to each other. And I remember sitting, because I was in both, you know, I'm in the NSA group, and I'm also in the, this is a DHS group. And I remember, you know, kind of doing that, you know, there is another outfit out there. And, but, you know, that that's sort of off the point. This framework brings it all under one model. And so it's NIST NICE if you want to uh, Google it up. But the NICE uh, workforce framework, for the first time, creates a vision of the field of cybersecurity that is sort of down, it's uh, seven areas, 
32 specialty areas, and then with those special within those specialty areas, the specific knowledge, skills, and abilities you got to have. Educators love that because now we know what to teach. Never knew it up to this point. Uh, probably can't do it across the board because, but we can start building teams of you know people basically kind of with related skills and kind of in the same. So at any rate, that's the best of initiatives right now, but it's by far the most mature. The cybersecurity, the critical infrastructure framework, uh, which is called the CSF, uh, is meant to sort of work with that and it provides a kind of a top level process that lets you kind of build, um, let's see, I just, just wrote the identify, uh, describe, uh, IPDRR, I can't remember what, but at any rate, it, it, identify, protect, D, I can't remember. That's fine, that's fine. Okay, anyway, long story short, that framework, the reason why I think it's pretty cool is because it was developed out of existing frameworks, one of the models being 27,000, another being COVID. Now these are control frameworks, and one of the things about this whole thing we've been talking about is you have to have specific behaviors defined that people can follow that's called best practice. And so in the end, what these are are best practice models, because there's no science here, you know, it's what worked. Um, the, the CSF has uh, a process at the top and it talks about control deployment at the bottom. Those controls basically are the things that you institute in an organization and say, follow this, don't be creative. You know, I don't want you to do it that way. I want you to do it this way and always that way. Why? Because this fits within the model and it's best practice. And maybe you don't know something somebody else knows, but these are meant to work together. And so, they're starting to come up with control frameworks, with large strategic control frameworks that they can implement. And the thing I like about the CSF the best is, when they rolled it out, they started talking about tax breaks. It was developed in conjunction with uh, business. And some of the larger companies now, can, if they can implement the CSF, get a little tax help. Um, now there's a field that is people don't even know about in risk, I don't think, but because it, it requires controls, risk requires controls, you have to have some kind of process that basically will do ongoing monitoring or assessment or evaluation, whatever you call it. Normally it falls into the uh, term is audit or information audit. <clears throat> and that's an entire different profession. Uh, the accounting companies, firms pretty much control it. But the bottom line basically is that um, the ability to come in and audit and certify something as correct in terms of the control requirements of the framework is like, you know, that's the best thing in the whole wide world because I know I can trust these guys because I know what they're doing. The reason why I know what they're doing is because they know what the controls are. Um, last but not least, you got the newest one, which is the RMF. That's got the same concept. It was meant specifically to deploy uh, NIST 853, which is the control framework for uh, the, the FISMA, Federal Information Security Management Act. Now, because it's the government, it only applies to the government, but it could easily apply to everybody else. And there's been some talk that if things don't, people don't clean up their act, they may extend FISMA to uh, the public sector. Uh, if that happens, expect something that would make the Foster World Obamacare look like a tea party. But you know, the idea basically is that those are specific, very explicitly defined controls in 17 areas that probably will make you more secure if you do it. But like I said, it gets back to the, it's gonna cost me, I mean, people hate 853 because it's got all these controls and they gotta do the, uh, you know, they have to do those practices and they gotta do them every day, you know, not just once in a while. Uh, that's called discipline. And so, you know, I mean, you've got all that going on and uh, in the end, basically, uh, the RMF, which deploys that, it does the over the top level evaluation, it goes to a top level of that, you know, identify the threat, categorize the threat, develop priorities, uh, you know, and it's, there's six general areas, uh, deploy the controls, evaluate the controls, authorize the controls, monitor the controls, you know, that's the step. Well, that's all good in concept. If you know what controls are, you know, I think once people start cracking open 853 in the private sector and see what 853 asks you to do, they may be asking for a different control set. But the bottom line basically is that, you know, it's not easy. It's not. It's not. You're absolutely right. It's not easy. I mean, it's good that we missed all those defined controls. But I 
my concern is that in spite of having all those controls, in spite of having all those guidelines and framework and software that they have developed, who is the enforcer? Who is accountable for enforcing that there is going to, everyone is going to implement risk management framework, everyone is going to identify the security risk, and everyone is going to notify the right authorities? And who are the right authorities? So my, my concern here is that we still don't have an accountable framework. In spite of, you know, there are many, many across nations, each pretty much each nation has their own framework, risk management framework. There are so yeah. many different risk management frameworks, but they are not working, you know, together collectively. They're all working in silos. Nations are working in silos. Industries are working in silos. Governments are working in silos. So the in spite of having all those different frameworks and resources that are being spent to, you know, manage risk, we are not able to manage risk effectively and we are seeing all these crises happening you know uh, every day or every other day because it is just not effective i don't feel i don't think that any framework that we have out there actually manages risk effectively it just has become process and i feel that you know insurance cyber insurance or the insurance industry can play a very critical role in enforcing and actually making sure that risk management frameworks are implemented. First, we have to, every nation is government industries, organizations, academia, they have to come together and come to terms with, okay, which framework we are going to use. They have to collectively build a framework that is security centric, integrated risk management framework that is able to identify and evaluate and manage each and every independent risk as well as interdependent risk. Once we have that defined framework, I think that you know cyber uh, insurance or the insurance industry can play a critical role because centuries ago insurance industry ensured that you know the gov buildings that were not in in proper standards for the fire code they were not issuing you know insurance for them so if centuries ago the insurance industry had the courage to decline to insure the you know buildings that were not built according to proper code insurance industry in 21st century they can play a very effective role by telling the you know entities across ngia that if you don't have a proper risk management structure in you know implemented within your organization you cannot buy insurance policy for your cyber security risk and once they say that and once they you know they make sure that the organizations are implementing the uh, risk management, security centric risk management framework, then any independent risk that any entity can manage on their own, that should not be insured. Because these days, if you see the culture is okay, let's buy insurance policy and not worry about managing the risk. So we are just transferring risk. We are transferring in risk and it's just becoming bigger and bigger. And then we end up getting big, you know, financial crises and all kinds of crises that we see across nations happening. So first we have to stop the culture of transferring risk, which we are able to manage on our own effectively. So insurance industry should not insure any risk that the entities can manage on their own. And the ones that they cannot manage where there are interdependencies, those risks should, you know, should be allowed to be insured. So I feel that if insurance industry steps in and actually goes back to its roots, of how why it was founded and how it was founded and the role that they could play in, in ensuring that you know cyberspace is secure. I think we can bring effective change, effective security change, and we can have effective risk management across nations. What are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I, you know, I hadn't thought of that, but I mean, I agree, agree completely. The problem is getting people to kind of getting it lined up to a point where it's worth somebody's effort to worth somebody's while to go through the effort um, and I you know insurance is critical for corporations who want to do business if the insurance companies actually were able to kind of stand up to what would be an awful lot of pressure um, then that would be one way to kind of enforce it because basically you're talking about self-interest here you know people do the right thing if it's a, if, if there's something in it for them I hate to sound like I'm old and jaded, but I'm old and jaded. So, uh, you know, you're never going to get enforcement uh, from a governmental standpoint. 
partly because we don't get along with other people's governments and partly because, you know, the folks inside the U.S. don't get along with other people's governments either. Uh, I mean, their own government. And so, you know, I don't, you can't really expect the, the feds to do anything about that or the state or anything like that. It really is going to have to come out of the private sector as a solution. Yes. And it's got to be, there are very few places that have leverage on everybody. One of them is insurance. And so, you know, the, the part of me that was hoping that they, people would sort of mend their evil ways is the, the one that wanted to, uh, it thought that maybe uh, a competitive advantage would, would be, you know, make it worthwhile. Uh, that was supposedly a thought behind ISO 27,000. People could get a certified security system and, you know, people would trust them more. So if my bank is ISO 27,000 certified and yours isn't, then I might want to kind of, you know, move my money over into the one that's certified. Um, problem is that, no, I don't know why it didn't catch on. They, there are things that have to do with, uh, the willingness of some uh, third-party agency in the U.S. to pick up that accreditation, and they never did it. Um, but the bottom line basically is uh, competitive advantage doesn't really sell. I guess maybe that's the main thing, uh, unless people are really afraid of, you know, they think of all the other reasons why, uh, you know, they want a bank there, like convenience, and they don't think about the fact that the bank might be is sort of available to anybody in the Ukraine who wants funds, you know. And so, I mean, you know, that sort of thing. But insurance, that's, an, it's funny, I've heard that mentioned in meetings in D.C. Thought was basically that, you know, uh, they'd use the insurance, uh, that insurance somehow had a part to play in because risk transfers are, you know, that, that, that's all that does is put the monkey on somebody else's back. Yes, yes. No, that, that's very true. And I recently wrote a paper about this cyber insurance uh, how they can bring effective change uh, and how they can effectively manage uh, the risk you know we face in cyberspace and because of cyberspace so i hope that you know the right people you know gets the message and they can take it forward so that we can have an intellect in, informed and intellectual dialogue about how to make it happen but it is possible insurance industry will be able to bring effective change in this and it's possible it's not going to be easy because not each nation has the concept of ensuring their risk so while advanced countries, Western you know, countries, they do have that and some other you know, developing countries have, are developing that concept, but not every nation has that. So it's not that it be, if we agree to this you know, cyber insurance uh, or the insurance industry taking control and be accountable for enforcing the uh, risk management uh, framework as well as you know, uh, not ensuring the risk that you know, entities can manage independently, that it, it, will, it will change overnight and it will bring positive change. There are a lot of hurdles to be overcome because there are many nations that are too weak to enforce this kind of change. There are many nations that doesn't have the you know concept of insurance. So there's still a lot of work to be done, but I, I see that that is the only way probably, you know, we'll be able to bring uh, effective change in uh, security risk of cyberspace. So because governments alone cannot, will not be able to enforce that. Governments probably will not be able to do anything about this, except, you know, uh, giving guidelines and you know giving suggestions, they will not be able to bring effective change. So that that's my thought, and that's what uh, I you know recently wrote in that paper, and I published. So let's see you know how it goes forward. But I feel that uh, that is a probable probable way to go forward and uh, manage the risk that we are facing. So now um, another question I have is that uh, with the war moving to cyberspace. It is necessary to recognize that while the best defense is a good offense, constructing proactive security risk defenses that include tools, technologies, and processes rather than the passive one becomes a necessity for survival as well as sustainability in not only cyberspace, geospace, and space, uh, in not only cyberspace, but also geospace and space. And the fierce mapping of cyberspace has already begun. Uh, we talked about how we can probably secure cyberspace. We briefly talked about how, what are the cybersecurity risks, but how do nations identify what their assets are in the cyberspace, geospace and space? What is the process that they can use? If you have any thoughts about that. Well, I mean, cyber war is, is a, I don't know, 15 year old term. Um, and obviously the only way that would be a, uh, 
you know, kind of be even an issue if we weren't so totally connected with each other. There have already been two major wars fought uh, in cyberspace. The folks in Estonia, um, they're the ones that kind of were the first recipients of that. But the people in Georgia, I'm not talking about down south. I'm talking about, you know, the country over there. Uh, not the one next to Alabama, but the one over there next to Russia. Um, you know, I don't know whether you recall, but they had what amounts to uh, an invasion uh, back. It was during the Olympics, I think, in China. Um, and uh, that was a classic combined arms operation where the first people before the tanks was a complete and total cyber attack on uh, the uh, weapon systems in the Georgians had. And uh, it was so totally su su successful that the Russians basically just motored right past them because their uh, what they had was probably roughly as, as lethal as something from the Civil War because uh, all of the uh, electronic components had been uh, turned off or whatever. I mean, I don't know what the, but the bottom line basically is that that was um, in factored into their uh, strategy for uh, invading the country. Uh, it worked perfectly. And oh, one other point, all the weapon systems that basically they took off the board were ours that we'd given the Georgians. So that, that leaves with our people with a little bit of something to think about. Um, the, you know, I mean, the whole bottom line basically is that from a, a warfare standpoint, that's been going on forever. In small, not so much, whatever. Yeah, and so you get stuff like the North Koreans uh, take Sony apart. And then for the next three days, they don't have any internet service. Uh, what a coincidence. Uh, we wouldn't call it an attack on our part, but for some reason they can't, uh, you know, they, they have no connection to the outside world. Uh, and then basically I have no idea what went on, but then they turn it back on, you know, probably courtesy of the Chinese. And so, I mean, the whole geopolitical thing is that everybody is so exposed that we're in the same situation I was at when I was a kid. You know, we had the bomb, the Russians had the bomb, and the only reason why we didn't use them on each other was because we use it on them, they use it on us. And so we had, I believe it was called mutually, mutually assured destruction. Well, that's keeping things the peace right now. Right, right, and now you're right about that. I hear you on that. Now, this is probably the last question. For the benefit of our global viewers and listeners, would you mind sharing details about all the books that you have written? Um, share what you know each book is about and where our audience, our viewers or listeners, where they can go and buy that book if they would like to you know, read that or purchase that. Well, thank you very much, first of all. Um, first one's out of print. Uh, it, it was one of my favorites too. It sort of reappeared in the one with Sigler, but first book was with Corey Scow, and it was uh, an attempt to kind of define a, a security uh, life cycle uh, or system, if you want to call it that, the enterprise, uh, information security for the enterprise. That was still back in the days when we called it information security, information assurance enterprise, sorry. Um, and that was built, built around what amounts to uh, security life cycle process that is sort of what I was outlining to you earlier. Uh, there's been, there were some problems with production. So the book has got some interestingly uh, that I'm not claiming, uh, you know, kind of misprints and other things in it, but what it introduces the concept of, uh, you know, kind of a logical process to follow uh, if you want to be secure. And it brings in the fact that the countermeasures you deploy are pretty much dependent on the risk you identify in the front end of the process. And so, you know, the countermeasures change as risk change. And so theoretically that's a uh, system. Second book uh, was something I picked up when I was in DC. The, originally the government was gonna do what a NICE eventually did uh, with something called essential body knowledge. And I was in the team that helped develop that. And so, you know, like a lot of things in the government that never got deployed, but it's got a lot of uh, the sort of the basic security areas of knowledge that you need to basically have, understand, to kind of define for the first time the concept of roles in, uh, that the EBK did in, 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 in doing that. And so 
it didn't just see it as a monolithic, you know, while I do cybersecurity, it's like, well, CISOs are not the same as the people who do privacy protection versus, you know. So at any rate, what it did was basically look at, at the various roles and kind of what they do in terms of things like physical security, but also continuity management and that sort of thing. Um, the one with uh, that's uh, engineering a better software organization actually is kind of a rewrite of the one that sort of we did in the 90s. Uh, it's based around the 12207 standard. If you haven't noticed, my own stock and trade is standards. If you want to understand my profession, which is basically kind of, uh, it's it's where we keep our knowledge. You know, we don't do it in textbooks and we don't really, we put it in the standard and you look at the standard and sort of these larger standards, that's that's where if you want to go, if you want to get expert. So anyway, this is based on the ISO 12207 standard, which is a life cycle standard for software development, maintenance and acquisition. And so if you want to understand everything there is to know about how to kind of structure the software lifecycle process uh, from either acquisition or from development direction, this is it. That's not my words of wisdom. I'm just interpreting what ISO says. And that one has got the advantage of being pretty much generally accepted as being the only standard out there. So unlike all the rest of them, where there's five or six different interpretations of what it's supposed to be, this is the standard. And so, like I said, if you understand the system development life cycle, system life cycle, that's the book to read. Um, the, I'm sort of losing track where I'm at. Uh, let's see. Oh, and then uh, the nice one is basically nice. Uh, it's a first to market book uh, from Taylor and Francis, which is got, I went with them because they're international in turn, they're a British firm. Uh, I think they're the largest in Great Britain, but the bottom line basically is that they, they'll push to a lot of places other than here. And I spend a lot of time overseas, so I work more with on the European side in some ways than I do here. Um, and I understand kind of where things are at. And, you know, but at any rate, my line basically is that puts out the definition of the field. Is, and I think you can pretty much take that to the bank because it's really the second iteration. The EDP, EBK was the first attempt to do that. Um, and if you want to sell yourself as a cybersecurity expert, you really got to know what knowledge area, what specialty you're in, what KSAs are involved, canal skills and abilities are involved. Because uh, I hear a lot of people talking, but they don't necessarily seem to know what they're talking about. And then, you know, uh, the controls book is one I did with uh, pretty much an expert on controls. The controls, I think, to me, are the key to the whole cybersecurity thing. Behaviors or uh, that you can document uh, and essentially persistent. And if you can't do that, then it ain't security. So anyway, that's the controls book. And uh, the one I'm working on right now is RMF. Risk management framework is probably the process that we're going to use, uh, no matter what control set we deploy. And so thank you very much for letting me plug my book. Oh, thank you, Professor Dan. In fact, you know, we are really honored that you spend uh, this valuable time with us and share your insights and wisdom in explaining the challenges that we face with risk management framework in, in how we are managing cybersecurity risk and how to bring some positive change in this because we feel that you know uh, across nations there are many frameworks and processes for managing risk but the challenge is that uh, most of the widely used and adaptive frameworks uh, they not they cannot effectively manage the interconnected and interdependent risk facing uh, nations, its government, industries, organizations, academia in cyberspace, geospace, and space. So either, while there are many frameworks, uh, there is not a single framework out there that can be effective in effectively managing inter interconnected and interdependent risk uh, facing each one of us, each entity across NGIA in CGS. So that is a challenge. And that is the reason risk group, cybersecurity risk research centers and strategic security risk research centers are created so that we can collectively identify, evaluate and manage the risk facing NGIO and CGS. And we can have uh, thought leaders like you, experts uh, in this field who can come and share their viewpoint so that we can you know, collectively identify how we can make this process uh, more effective, more better, so that you know we can have a uh, proper security and probably can have proper uh, cyber security, so that everyone can uh, benefit from this uh, amazing you know innovation that uh, has happened because of the computer code and connected computers, and they can benefit for their advantage. And we at Risk Group feel that uh, we believe firmly that risk management 
Security and peace walk together hand in hand. Though security is related to management of threats and peace to the management of conflict, risk management is related to the management of security vulnerabilities as well as the management of conflict. And if it is not possible to conceive uh, any one of the three without the existence of the other two, all three concepts feed into each other. So we believe very firmly that the security we build for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secured for everyone across nations. Tradition becomes our security. So if we build a culture of managing risk effectively, it will lead us to security and security will lead us to peace. So let's manage the existing and emerging risk together. For more information on the risk roundups, to watch the risk roundup videos or to hear the risk roundup podcast, please go to riskgroupllc.com. Do not forget to share and subscribe. Until next time, I'm Jayashree Pandya, your host of Risk Roundup, signing off. See you next time. Thank you.